we got it greg we made it to episode ip004 the big one the first long player on independent project records and um this is this is a big one i'm really excited about this and this is a band that you know a little bit about, Greg, since you actually played in the band. And I'm pretty sure that there's several songs on this album that you know quite well and probably played more than you can even count, I'm sure. Yes, there are a number. <laughs> Indeed. And we got three of the uh, four. The OGs. The OGs here. So, Bruce, welcome back. Glad to be here. Thank you for pulling this all together for us. All right. And Phil, a.k.a. Jackson Del Rey, welcome back. Okay for life. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then Mr. Jeff Long, welcome. Yeah, thanks for having me. And then, as we know, the fourth member of the band at this point was Mark Erskine, who we talked a little bit about, Bruce, when we were talking about the bridge recordings, who uh, he eventually did some percussive work with you there. But yeah. um, my understanding is he's no longer with us. So you guys are what's left. Yeah, that's kind of our understanding as well. Um, we have not heard from him for well over a decade. And, uh, you know, I don't know for sure that he's no longer on the planet, but, um, but we're assuming that's the case. We tried to, tried to hunt him down. We couldn't find him. So for now... We'll have to settle for you three. <laughs> so, so we did. Um, we're. I'm trying to think of some transitions that we've had in our previous conversations. And as we've mentioned, Bruce, you did um, do some work with Mark, and then uh, with them rhythm ants that we spoke about uh, last time on our episode IP003 uh, with Phil and Bruce. But then we have a new member, and uh, you alluded to it offline, Greg, and. Uh, as a member of this band right here. <laughs> so and uh, if I don't know how well you can see this, but there you there you are. Yep. <laughs> I believe you're 17 years old at that at that yep. point. Just a kid. So my understanding yeah. is Phil uh brought you to a rehearsal. Is is that correct, Jeff? Do you remember how you came to be a part of this project? Yeah, you know, Phil took me under my under his wing, uh, you know, when I was a young pup and, uh, you know, taught me a few cool riffs. And I'm like, wow, that's awesome. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, he invited me to a rehearsal. I Phil, I don't know what the I, I don't know why, um, but we were just jamming outside of everything. And you just invited me along one time and the uh, rest is history, I guess. Yeah, we uh, were playing 80s covers for the most part. Uh, I remember we used to play uh, Watching the Detectives. Oh, that's right, yes. <laughs> and we played, um, what was that other one? Oh, uh, London Calling. And then I'm kind of looking at you going, this guy can play. <laughs> wow, that's pretty damn good, you know? And it sort of gelled from there, believe it or not, yeah. Is a, really your, your bass sound is a real integral part, or the bass in bass in general, and, and your a lot of your playing in particular of the Savage Republic sound. I I, I would venture to say, yeah, you're all shrugging your shoulders and being all well, uh, false, I mean, falsely just, modest. Because, you know, Bruce. I think Bruce had some, you know, had the most distinctive uh, bass lines. Um, so yeah, yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, but I also want to give credit, a lot of credit to Bruce for those bass lines. Well, we, you know, it, it was interesting because the very first, um, songs that we worked on the very first rehearsal of the band, we had two basses, um, and a couple of guitar amps and this funky drum kit that Mark had just gotten from his, I think his, parents had bought for him and a bunch of scrap metal cans and things. And, and we just kind of went down into the tunnels under UCLA to see what, what would happen, you know, what could we come up with? And so, I mean, there's definitely that there's several different distinctive bass sounds. There's, you know, my bass through the guitar, which is really kind of grungy, but then Jeff, once he got like a proper, 
was playing through a proper bass amp and wasn't doing the fuzz box, <laughs> then, um, you know, he, he developed definitely a, a very uh, unique sound with, with his bass playing and just the way that, that Jeff plays the bass. I mean, a uh, lot of, you know, finger, fingers on strings and, I don't know. Did you ever use a pick, Jeff, or was it always just fingers? No, that was like verboten. You know, it's like I, I was trying <laughs> to be Jaw Wobble from PIL. Okay. So, there you go. know, it's like he's always, you know, his fingers only. <laughs> well, but that's it also, worked. I think, in, in a way, when you look at sort of punk versus the post punk approach to playing, um, most of the, a lot of the punk stuff. Was very was very stripped down and basic, you know. Dot 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 dot. When you when things started morphing, I think where kind of things start to demarcate a little bit is when you start bringing in other types of influences, um, you know, whether it's you know like kind of funk stuff. You know, you look at like Gang of Four or Pop Group or people like that. Dub, um, you know, obviously, you know the PI, you know, that's kind of I think a, an influence on somebody like Jaw Wobble. And then, um, you know, other just real pure hell, brutal noise, like August Keys' Swan stuff. So, um, yeah, I think that's one of the, in fact, one of the markers of a, of a, particular, of a particular shift in the sound of where, of, I mean, I don't want to dwell too long on the, on the role of the bass, but I'm just saying that's one of the things that was more interesting about um, you know, certainly Savage Republic and also, you know, some, some of the other things that were happening contemporaneously. If I can use those big or and a half words. You can't appreciate that. <laughs> so I think another influence on this record, Bruce, if I'm not mistaken, was the introduction of the monotone guitar. Is that right? Like, I think shortly before, not too long before this, you had a big influence. Um, yeah. In in a show, is that correct? Yes, um, it was probably a couple of months after we first started getting together when I saw a flyer at UCLA where uh, Phil and I had been going to school um, for uh, a gig by Glenn Branca. Um, and I had known, I had never heard any of his music, but I'd kind of known of him through the, the no wave scene in New York. And I thought, oh, I should go check this out. and. It was at um, Cal Arts in Valencia, about 30 miles north of, of UCLA. So I drove out there and, and saw this performance and he had four guitars and a bass player and a drummer and all the guitars were uniquely tuned. And, and you know, they spent like 10 minutes tuning up before their gig and I just thought, wow, this is one of the most beautiful things I'd ever heard, you know? And it just, it kind of blew me away what, what they were doing, the sounds they were creating and and just the, the kind of layers of, of sound that were shifting and, and bouncing around the room. And I started hearing things I couldn't see anybody playing. And I was just like, wow, this is amazing. So afterwards I went up to talk to them as they were putting their guitars away. And I realized that they had some guitars they had all the same strings on them. And it, it was like, oh, you don't have to tune your guitars normally. And so, on the drive home, I was like, I'm doing that, you know? <laughs> and so before the next rehearsal, I put all B strings on my guitar and tuned them all to the same note. And, and we just started jamming with that. And the first song that we came up with was Exodus. Um, was, there, was there a reason why you chose to tune it all in, in, in Bs rather than uh, a lower or higher tone or something? I was trying to find a, a string that, that was comfortable enough to play that, heavier strings were kind of too hard to hold all six strings down and it seemed like the 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 small e strings were like too tinny somehow it just too shrill yeah and i i just gravitated to b and and that uh uh so that's what i chose so at that point did you have a name were you were you africa for yet or how did that come about that you chose that name and chose that approach I, you know, I don't remember when we first came up with the name. I think it was more, you know, obviously when we first started doing shows, <clears throat> that was when we figured we needed a name. But I don't remember exactly when that was. I don't, I, I wasn't keeping accurate notes of 
when we did <laughs> yeah, I don't I, I I seem to think it was before our first show and I thought I thought Phil was the inspiration for that uh, or I, I don't know do you remember Phil uh, not really the only thing I really remember from back then was saying something like I think Jethro Tull's already taken <laughs> <laughs> and nobody played the flute yet so what can you do yeah. right <laughs> well, it, really so, so on my copy, which I think I got 187 is my copy, um, and I think there's several like this. So the insert uh, does at one point did say Africa Core, yes, um, and that's been blotted <clears throat> out and replaced with Savage Republic. So it it was definitely a name at some point that at least for a little while, correct? Well, probably for the first year, I would say that we were together. Um, you know, we recorded the album. We were getting ready to put it out and but by that time we'd started having some you know skinhead types coming to some of our gigs and kind of thinking we were neo-nazis and we're kind of like no that's not going to work and then i think phil finally put his foot down and said hey guys we need to do something about the name um and so we just sat down and had had a, a you know brainstorming session and between the two of us, we, we sort of came up with it, as, as far as I remember anyway. I mean, I was Phil, do you so, have any, recollect, any recollections, Phil, of that conversation? Uh, you know, it's funny because the, I, I do have one funny memory of it. Uh, I remember Mark saying, hey, I made that up. And Bruce and I both like looked at him like, what? <laughs> <laughs> you know, he was leaving a I remember that. that. So, you know, but just think about it. We could have ended up being the mollusks or something. You know? <laughs> That's true. <laughs> that building over there is named Elvis. I wonder if it's a public bath. You know? <laughs> there you go. Absolutely. No. So, Phil, on the previous record, um, you were listed as Philip Drucker. On this record, uh, Jackson Del Rey. Uh, is the pseudonym that you used. Um, can you talk about where that came from and why you decided to use a different name? Um, well, a lot of it actually uh, came from right around that time. I actually found out um, that my on my mother's side, uh, my roots are actually in Spain and Portugal. Um, and uh, I started becoming very interested in uh, Spanish culture. And um, so I was reading a lot of books back then and things of that nature. And I wanted a name that sort of more reflected what I was going through at the time, uh, learning about all this. And uh, so I came up with the Del Rey part uh, all by myself. That was <laughs> and But the funny part was, is I could not think of a first name. And then one day I was sitting around with Caroline Collins and she was uh, we were watching uh, Shanana and um, the TV show yeah. so we'd run home from class and watch Shanana and on one of the episodes Bowser said now you're cooking with gas Jackson and we both looked at each other and we said Jackson Del Rey that's it okay. yeah. that's where the name came from so if anyone ever asks for a trivia question, the connection between Shanana and Savage <laughs> Republic. There we've it got, is. We've got the answer right there. Wow. Dad and I want to put in a good word for, you know, Mickey's Big Mouth beer. That's what we drank all day. So <laughs> I'm sure that had something to do with it. <laughs> Probably. Well, and you also did it, Phil, you did a, um, a sort of a side project there for a, a little bit called Del Rey and the Sun Kings. <laughs> and I remember uh, it was kind of, what was it, sort of a surf band? Uh, kind of thing. Our, and, yeah. No. yeah, our goal in life was to play in a basement in a frat. That pretty much explains it. <laughs> yeah, I had another band that couldn't play. <laughs> I was but really Jeff, you were you were playing uh, you were you were simultaneously playing with, with Wasted Youth and, and Savage Republic. Right. So that kind of a, it's kind of an interesting uh, I mean it's not completely completely uh, out of the realm necessarily, but it's a little bit different of a, kind of a, a little bit different of a feel or a little bit different of a crowd that you would tend to get, I would imagine. Yeah, hardcore punk versus, you know, a more <laughs> artsy crowd. 
Right. Uh, I, I think the funny thing about that is, I mean, Bruce and Phil, you knew I was in Wasted Youth, right? Yeah, okay. But yeah. Wasted Youth didn't know I was in Savage Republic. <laughs> they were, I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah, they were very, very upset when they found out because I, I don't know why, I don't know what they thought you, Wasted Youth was <laughs> going to become the new Black Flag or the new Circle Jerks or whatever. But they're like, you know, you, you, you can't, can't be doing can't. that already shit. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly, Bruce. Exactly, exactly right. So it's so, like, you know, uh, it, it, there was, it, it's funny enough. I mean, hardcore punk had its own conformity. And, yeah. you know, you, can, you couldn't really step out of that. And I, I have to tell everybody, I mean, the Wasted Youth guys are fine, but I much, much more enjoyed Savage Republic. It's wow. interesting um, that, you know, when, when we would, you know, I'm, I'm thinking like in the 80s period, uh, when I was, when I was in, involved with it, we were, we tended to be, Savage Republic tended to be either the, 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 the token, like noisy punk band on the, the bill with the art bands, the more gentle art bands, or they, we would be the, the token art band <laughs> on the bill with a bunch of hardcore bands you know so you know you you'd play with whatever some some sensitive types one gig and then the next gig we're, we're playing with like you know the angry Samoans and stuff so it's sort of an, an interesting dichotomy yeah that is interesting that just doesn't quite fit right <laughs> yeah it, it kind of does if you're a little more open-minded but yeah there was that was kind of one of the things that happened when sort of hardcore became the the thing it it, uh, it it, it sort of there was that it was there was a lot of really good energy, but at the same time, it brought a certain amount of conformity to the things that what you were, you know, what was cool to be into or whatever, so whatever. <laughs> if you, you if you guys don't mind, I'm really curious how these songs came together. So I imagine that uh, you guys uh, developed these songs in rehearsal, not so much something that you 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 built in the studio these were songs that you actually developed in in rehearsal is that correct yeah i would say so i mean we definitely you know we would get together and and practice and somebody would have an idea and and we would all kind of figure out i think as jeff has sent, mentioned before in uh, recent interviews you know we'd all try to find our place in in that space that was that somebody was creating and i think you know we were also always trying to to try new things and ex experiment some and um but yeah really i mean there there were a few things that were kind of create studio creations like procession was was pieced together from several different parts and some of those parts are are on the the new um expanded reissue of of the album um which uh, you know that that long version of procession on on the expanded album i was i had an idea in my mind of what we were going to do and so it's kind of like the last two thirds of that is just mark drumming and i thought okay we're going to layer a bunch of stuff on top of this and we ended up going into radio tokyo and just taking a bit of that a couple minutes of that and then constructing other stuff around it. But most of the songs were recorded in, or were come up with in rehearsals, either in the tunnels under UCLA or the parking garages, because those were sort of the places that we worked early on. I have a question also about the, um, the lyric, how did you, <coughs> uh, how did you guys uh, work out the, the, the songs with vocals and, and lyrics? Um, I know that, you know, between Phil and Jeff, I mean, did you have the, the lyrics ahead of time, that, like something that you were doing, or how did you, how did that come about? Because I think that's also one of the, the, the real interesting things about uh, Tragic Figure is that it's equally, you know, it's that split between instrumental stuff that's very unique and then the vocal stuff, which is very, which is very unique. Um, so what was Phil? And Jeff, Bruce, what was the, your process in terms of like writing 
in, uh, songs with, with lyrics and vocals. Can I handle that one? Go for it. Because I, I have some really interesting <clears throat> things of that. Um, I, Jeff is like, you know, I mean, to me, he's like, he was like the punk, um, you know, the punk um, Tupac. And he'd say, I got some lyrics for this. <laughs> and he'd jump in the room and he'd start singing. And I'd sit in there be going, funky, man. <laughs> Sounds good to me. So I was always really like in awe that he could do that. Whereas I would always write out lyrics as much as I could. And it's all scratched up and everything. And I'm sitting here reading them for the first time off of a page most of the time. And I'm shaking. And I, it's just like, 180 opposite how we approach lyrics and I always was like you know I have to admit I was a little jealous I really wish I could do what you did but I, that was one of the things that really kind of I thought was interesting that we really came from writing lyrics from a very different uh perspective um you know so I also uh if you don't mind I'd like to just go back and also mention uh one thing about uh, about Jeff Long um, that hasn't uh, he had a couple of interviews and things, but you know it, we all had our influences. Uh, but Jeff really he introduced me to a lot of international punk bands that I would have never known existed because he was into buying the singles and stuff, and he was a cassette guy, you know. And I still remember he was like the first time I heard Crass. He was the first time I heard Chelsea. He was the first time I heard all these different bands. And then one day he turns me on to this band called Discord. I don't even know if you remember them anymore. Yeah, I do. Oh, yeah. Damn. They are hardcore. Oh my God. That Discharge, is that? No, dis Discharge was another one. Another one, because I, I remember you bringing a Discharge record to rehearsal once. Yeah, that, yeah that too. Yeah, insane stuff. The Brits, the Brits were just would go to and take it to another level. It was unbelievable. Yeah. And yeah. most of that stuff just never, never was heard in the U.S. It was weird. It was that it was just that vinyl fetish on Melrose yeah. that uh, was the only place that I knew of. You know, and maybe there's probably places in New York, but the only place I knew of in L.A. that would ever get anything like that, and I would just. I would just buy it, you know, without without hearing it and and see what was on it. So yeah, that, that's that's interesting, Phil. Thanks thanks for bringing that up. Yeah, and and you also introduced me to a. Uh, I liked reggae, uh, but you introduced me to a much uh, harsher end of it too. Uh, I I still remember that guy Muta Baruka. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I can't believe you remember that. that. Yeah. That, dude was, I, that had an effect on me. That record, check it. Yes. I was like, damn, this is good stuff, you know? <laughs> and here I thought Burning Spear was hardcore, and I'm like, like <laughs> you know, and look at that. Yeah, so there's a funny, there's a, there's a funny, uh, funny story about that. So we were, we were doing our tour, and we were in Canada, and we went to a, a, a radio show, and, uh, you know, the, the guy's like, well, you know, do you want me to play, play anything? You know, they, they would do an interview and then they would play some music and they'd do a little bit of an interview. And so I had, I had that, Phil, if you remember, I had that on the cassette and I go, here, play this. And he sticks it in and it's this hardcore reggae and he just did not know what to do. It was completely <laughs> unexpected. And uh, uh, it, was, it was great. <laughs> we're kind of staring at him like, that's why we're on stage and you're in the studio. <laughs> <laughs> the vibe we were giving off in those days. So uh, it's good stuff, though, man. Real good stuff. Mm, still remember some of that. <laughs> so, Jeff, with your lyrics, did you have any kind of literary background, or what? What did you bring to your your lyrical writing? Oh, that's a really good question. I mean, I, I you know, all I can say is these things would just come to me, and so you know, I just. They were metaphorical for what I was going going through at the time, um, and you know, and just uh, pulling stuff from that visceral place, you know, in, in your soul. And so that's the best place to pull from. Yeah, I guess <laughs> um, it can be uh, it can be messy, man. <laughs> <laughs> it's 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 some pretty memorable stuff. I mean, all all of the. The, the lyrical material on, on Tragic Figure 
is it, it just it just sticks with you, you know, you know, um, uh, next to nothing, machinery, real man, all of that. Procession is is like the song that just is is perfect for any day and age, or especially nowadays. It just seems, um, you know, and and I think that that's one thing that gives the record it, it's it, it's rather timeless, you know. Um, it's in fact, I was, um, I know, uh, it was posted a, a, a sort of a, a, a joint review of the reissue of this, the new reissue of Tragic Figure, and then also the, the new Meteora album. But some of the comments, um, uh, just that you know, it's, um, I need glasses to read this, but it, it, it it's just. Potent sound intensified by stars, sparse attention to lyrics. That is, some songs have words and some don't. But uh, you know, like the bit, it's it's, it's a political. But at the same time, you're only saying it's not like you you're just going to go on and on. You say what needs to be said, and then you can you kind of that's it. Move on to the next thing. That's some some good stuff. You know. The, well, the stylistic say, spectrum is wide throughout, and especially so on procession, which is quite multifaceted. <laughs> nice. You know, it's just where, the, where is that? Re uh, where, pardon me. What? Pardon me. Where is that review from? It is from. Um, you go online to the Vinyl District. Oh, okay. They have a. It's like I guess a a feature that they do every. What I don't know. Uh, if you call it an edition or not, but graded on a curve. And then right. they they talk about the reissue and how you know it just said it's like it's 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 shockingly good forty years later. You know? Well, great! Yeah, I have to look for that. If if you don't mind me yeah. saying on you know on that reissue, Bruce has come up with an artistic masterpiece and how he has packaged this thing. I mean, Bruce, it was Thank quite you guys. impressive. Um, so, you know, if, if anybody out there is, you know, likes to collect these kinds of things, this would be well worth the money. Uh, you know, I just, I don't know, are all of them white vinyl, Bruce, or red vinyl? No, well, there's <clears throat> 300 of them that are the, the translucent vinyl with the letterpress packaging. And then there's a larger pressing on the red vinyl with kind of a more traditional gatefold sleeve. Okay. Um, and then there's the CD version. So, but both of those are were just are just phenomenal, and, and just really, really admire your, you know, your your artistic uh, uh, touch on this, Bruce. So, um, you know, thank you it's, for producing this. It's my pleasure. It's something I've I've had kind of in my mind for close to a decade that I wanted to do a reissue of this album and an expanded version and um, you know really glad that it finally came together the way that it did so that's and, uh, the Africa core rehearsals and such are really crucial <laughs> crucial information I yeah. like to just kind of throw in that uh, I um, when I saw the the package it became almost immediately for me this is now my definition of what a labor of love should look like. It, it, I can't put it any better than that. I, it's, but it's, it's, it is what it is. And it's just, it's beautiful. And it's so many other things at the same time. I just. <laughs> hey. Amazing. Um, glad you're pleased. I have a question also regarding, because uh, I know you, uh, what when you were when you were playing out when you start when the, the the original band was was started was starting to play out what was the reaction like and I know you you did some you know you had some fairly good sized shows opening for PIL and things like that I mean how I, and I've heard I mean I've heard all kinds of great stuff about it but uh, I mean generally what was what was the audience reaction when you're playing to in front of people that had no clue as to what, what you're about. You know, it, it really varied. There were people that, that appreciated it and then others that didn't. I remember that PIL show in Pasadena um, early on. I mean, we didn't get both of the PIL shows that we did. We did not get a sound check at all. We, it was just like, get up on stage and play. And so 
in a situation like that, a lot of times it takes you like half the set to kind of actually get together and get your sounds right. And, and so I remember at that PIL show, there was some guy in the audience, um, you know, three songs in that between songs was yelling at us, go practice at home, you know, and wow. but by the end of the set, he was out there going, yeah, you know, so it's oh. like, we, you know, we managed to pull it off. Um, but, and then I don't know, um, you know, if you've, the, uh, there was that live, early live recordings that I released in 1990 or so um, that has a lot of crowd chatter in between. And there was one gig that we did on that um, West Coast tour in early 83, I guess it was. Um, I think it was in Seattle or someplace like that. And, you know, so this guy in between songs yells, you guys suck. And, you know, and then Jeff comes <laughs> in, it's like, you know, he's like talking back and forth with the guy, like, oh, you're, you're really cool. Yeah, right. <laughs> trying to defuse the situation. But I do remember there was, there was one gig where these punks outside were pissed off that they couldn't get in. And so they like broke the door, the glass door to the little art gallery. And it was, yeah. I mean, there's, there were definitely times when we were not appreciated and others where people were just like really excited to see something new and different, you know. That, that, that episode that you're relating there was really tough because the owner of that art gallery had no idea what kind of people were going to show up. And there was everybody from, you know, art, art, art people to hardcore punks. And when the hardcore punks started to get violent, he was freaking out and yeah. that's when he he ran up to us and said you've got to do something you've got to do something and i'm like wow all right we'll try but <laughs> so that was uh boy that uh i feel i i to this day feel bad for that guy yeah so i had a question guys so uh we're, we're learning about how these you guys are rehearsing uh you guys got together you're putting these songs together i'm curious about the recording session so it's primarily Radio Tokyo, it sounds like, but some recordings from um, the UCLA uh, sessions you brought to Radio Tokyo, is, is that? Well, we, we started off recording in the parking garages because okay. we were, we were um, rehearsing in there. And I remember, I think Phil had a little boom box or some sort of little thing, uh, cassette tape recorder. And we taped a number of our rehearsals and some of those cassettes still exist. And, and I'm trying to think, I don't think we've used, we used anything from those recordings, but I do have some that I've kind of been thinking about. There's, you know, in pulling together the songs for the bonus tracks on this reissue, I was running across other early recordings and thinking, oh, we should do something with this. So there could be another archival release of some of that material at some point down the road. We'll, we'll see what happens. But, um, but yeah, I, got, I bought this TX4 track, Reel to Reel Tape Deck, and, because I wanted to record an album. And you know, I got a couple of microphones and we started, you know, we would set up and, and start recording. And I just, at the time, I just felt like I didn't have the knowledge or the ability to, to do a good enough job. And, you know, so we recorded a lot of that stuff that ended up being on the bonus material for this expanded release. And then we'd heard about Radio Tokyo and we thought, okay, we really need to go into it. We need, really need to go into a studio and work with somebody who knows what they're doing. Um, and so we did that. And there are, you know, like, and Kill the Fascists on Tragic Figures was actually recorded in the subterranean utility tunnels on my TAC 4 track. Um, and then <clears throat> parts of Procession were recorded in the parking garages on the 4 track. There's a couple of things like the intro, the bells and things for Ivory Coast. That's from the parking garage. So, I mean, there were bits and pieces from the parking garage that we used on, on Tragic Figures with the Radio Tokyo recordings. Okay. Zulu, Zulu Zulu was that um, also recorded? Uh, Phil, the, Phil uh, recorded that at home. That's a, oh. a home recording of Phil's. He has a, a, a home tunnel that he can get that that reverb sound. 
<laughs> yeah. So, but um, but yeah. So basically, all those four track recordings just um, you know, I set them aside and they put, went in boxes and and sat there for decades. And um, it was interesting to go back to them and just realize how good they actually were. And I, I have to say that I think my favorite drum sounds that we ever got were those parking garage recordings of Mark's funky wooden drum kit with one microphone sitting right out in front of his drum kit in the parking garage. And it's perfect. That's natural mix. Exactly. Yeah. So, so you, ac you actually favor those over the studio drum sounds. Absolutely. Wow. Yeah. wow. Like almost any studio drum sound that I've ever been involved with. I don't know. What can I say? I, I mean, that, that kind of makes sense to me, though. Um, and I'll tell you what, and I agree. Um, because you're talking about a band that starts in a utility tunnel. And it's hot. It's sweaty. And, you know, you're pouring sweat as we're playing these songs. And it's making these, uh, it's setting up a mood. And it's setting up an environment. And then yeah. all of a sudden you find yourself outside in a parking garage and you're still thinking about that sound. And so how do you, how do you get it now? Because now you're in this big spacious uh, parking garage. And so it, it comes out the answers one like. <laughs> well, <thank you. laughs> but then, then you find yourself in a recording studio. And I got to tell you, the first thing I did was I started to shut down because it seemed so, you know, constraining. I mean, now what are we going to do? And so it really interested me that we, I, I did not remember that we have, we cut that stuff up. But now that I'm thinking about it, it makes perfectly good sense. Yeah. Yeah, it was kind of a bummer that there was a mic on everything. So then you could hear how bad you really were. And uh, <laughs> it just, just well, they, never really got that before in the tunnels or at the, at the parking garage. So yeah. I was like, oh boy. Well, the interesting thing about that version of Procession that's on the bonus album, the, the like six or seven minutes of Mark's drumming, what makes that interesting is that there actually were more microphones around because we were recording the guitars at the same time as the drums. So there were guitar mics. And so at some point, decades ago I had made that mix that was on that's on the record and I was switching back and forth between different microphones and combining several and then stripping it down to one and there's something about that whole construction that I just did as an experiment decades ago that I think really works and that's what that was why I decided to put that entire 10 minute piece on on the record is I thought this works and and Phil's guitar work on that he kind of took that to another level and then you know I had some fun with doing whatever it was I was doing with my voice you know <laughs> and then there was Mark with his magical drum beat that was just an awesome drum drum beat that he came up with and it's one of the best of all times I think it's, that piece is fantastic. That alone is worth buying the reissue, for, <laughs> if not everything else. So, Jeff, this wasn't your first time in the studio. You recorded with Wasted Youth, right? So, um, wh what was it like for you being in the studio recording these Savage Republic songs at Radio Tokyo? Uh, I think I had the same feeling as Phil that it was it was it was a bit. A bit sterile. I, I don't know. There's something about um, the soundproof walls that was just not not our thing. And um, you know, I think Bruce, you brought in reverb later and mixing and everything, which was great. Um, yeah. But it was just a little disconcerting at the time, you know, in playing to not have that natural reverb that we yeah. had in, in our other environments. So that that was that was tough to get over at, at first. Yeah, that was a challenge. Um, sequencing is something that's always interesting to me. And this is the first long player album on Independent Project. How did you guys sequence the album? Was it a group effort? Do you guys recall how that came to play? To me, I could be mistaken, but I think 
side one is primarily Phil singing when there are vocals and side two, maybe Jeff, more Jeff heavy. Um, I could be okay. wrong about that, but um, did that have anything uh, to do with the sequencing? Do you guys recall? The only thing I recall about this sequencing was I think when all else fails was going to be followed by attempted coup. I think we were set on that. Yeah. Being the first two songs we played. Okay. I think everything else was, it was what it was. And okay. Wherever it fit, it fit. I don't really remember making any great decisions about any of the other songs where they would go. Although I do remember a little bit, correct me if I'm wrong about, we were a little, didn't know whether we wanted to start too with machinery or mobilization, I think. But that's the only other thing I really remember at all about the sequence. And yeah, so. we actually didn't record mobilization till later. That ah. we recorded that at the time that we recorded the film noir single. Ah. Um, so, and and in a sense, and to to kind of just jump back, Jeff, about your your questions about the lyrics. I would have to say that every song that has singing on it or lyrics was pretty much pulled together as an instrumental piece before the lyrics were added. Okay. Um, we were playing not only machinery, but mobilization as instrumental songs live before we went into the studio. And so in most cases, the lyrics were, the the vocals were recorded or the lyrics were come up with as we were in the studio recording them as as far as i recall in most cases not necessarily all of them um, what was what was the um uh like the time frame in between when you guys started started playing live to when you when you went into the studio i mean how long have you been playing together at that point when you went in I'm thinking that our first rehearsal was sometime in early 1981. And I don't remember exactly when. Um, the first gig that we ever did was at the Brave Dog. And I could go back and, and I still have the flyers from that. Um, so we could find the date on that as far as when our first gig was. That was the the last gig of Bridge and the first gig of Africa. The Brave Which, Dog was quite a place. That was yeah. awesome. That was cool. I mean, if you want, if you wanted post-punk art, you know, an artistic experience, this was the place to go. It was really yeah. cool. It was kind of this narrow um, storefront in in uh, First and Alameda, Tokyo. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, right there next to the Atomic Cafe. And I remember it was, I mean, we ended up renting it for the night because we weren't actually booked there. It was, we were, this show was, was scheduled for this other little art gallery in, was it like Beverly in Vermont? And then we found out like a week before that it was closing down and we couldn't do the gig there. So somebody had told us about the Brave Dog and I got their phone number and they said, yeah, we'll rent you the space for $100. And um and you can put on your show there. So we managed to kind of change the flyers and, and try to get the word out as best we could. I think we brought in $102 at the door. So we, <laughs> we paid for it, had two bucks left over. But oh, it was just a piece, man. This, this big um, uh, like refrigerator freezer in the back of the room. And it was bring your own beer kind of thing. And so during our set, People were always opening and slamming this refrigerator door. <laughs> and I had set up my four track on top of the refrigerator to record us. And I just remember, you know, throughout the entire set, there's like this slamming refrigerator door in the middle of songs and stuff. Wow. <laughs> but you guys did, did do a show though, uh, or I don't know if it was Savage Republic or if it might have still, still been Bridge. Didn't you do a show at that, um, at that gallery on like Beverly in Vermont? Yes, yeah, that was Bridge, did okay. Bridge, and there were a couple of other things earlier on. It's called the Los Angeles Museum of Art. Yeah, they, they had some pretty good parties there, because the guy yeah. who ran it would get trash cans full of ice, and then get uh, plain wrap vodka, 
pints and fifths and just fill it. You know how some places they have beer and wine at openings? He would have bottles of vodka. And um, so parties, the, the, the party, the opening parties or after parties tended to get pretty, uh, pretty interesting. And then people, some of the street people would come in and yeah, go ahead, grab yourself a bottle. Wow. But <laughs> no, I remember I, that I, place pretty well. As I recall, it was Jonathan Gold who had connected us with with the guy that that ran that place, and and one of the things that I remember really liking about that place is that the the storefront windows, because it was a storefront on Beverly, yeah. and the storefront windows were frosted. You would enter through the back, and the bands would play like in the storefront windows, and so you'd have all these colored lights of the cars going by at night. Uh, it was like a light show behind the bands playing there. Very cool space. There was this kind of narrow, like walkway or out, not not an alleyway because it was part of the building, but it, it, yeah, it walkway. Like, yeah, and they they would generally you would have all these candles all over everything, and then the trash cans full of uh, ice and vodka bottles. So I'm thinking that that first show we did, maybe it was April or of '81 or something. I could look it up, but um, and then. I would guess that within a few months, we started working on recordings. Um, I think early on, we decided we wanted to do an album. Everybody was doing singles and we just thought we need to make, we're doing, we're coming up with a lot of really interesting creative music. We need to make a bigger statement than just putting out a single. So we just focused on recording an album. Wow. And you mentioned Jonathan Gold. Uh, he's listed as the producer for this album. Did he play a traditional role as a producer? Um, I think, you know, maybe it, maybe it was through him that we connected with Radio Tokyo. I don't remember, but yeah. I think we, we probably felt like, okay, he's got some more experience than us with music. And, you know, let's bring, let's have him help us pull this together. Phil, you might remember more about Jonathan than I do at that point. I oh, I, yeah, he had a, you know, he's a guy who I, I met John Gold at one of his performances when he performed naked playing uh, Black Sabbath covers on a viola, which was, wow. in, you know, <laughs> covering was one of the, the versions of Tank Burial. Oh, well, he did a great version of Sweet Leaf, as I recall. Um, yeah, well, and like, yeah. I, I saw him play one time where he was doing playing a cello through like a full Marshall stack yeah. you know um I backed up I think from a with a couple of the people from the Angry Samoans yeah and yeah did, did Sunshine of Your Love and oh and, I remember and that yeah, yeah. I've never seen him do that at the music machine if you remember yeah because he yeah. always opened for Overman which was a <laughs> band was that it? he played in was Russell Jessam in Overman? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah okay. So I, I just want to bring out that why wouldn't you want him to produce your record? I mean, exactly. <laughs> there you go. That's, yep. that's real street cred. <laughs> and for those who don't, uh, maybe for those who aren't listening, uh, I brought up Russell Jessam, who was one of the triumvirate that did the Anti Club, which was a real incubator and uh, just generally great performance space in LA. Um, Russell Jessam, uh, Jim Van Tine, and Jack Marquette. Yeah. Jack Marquette was one that was the, one, the the main guy behind the Brave Dog. So yeah. just so everybody knows what he's talking about. <laughs> yeah. And and Russell had a, a later band called Food and Shelter that yeah Phil, Phil released yeah. an album on his Resistance Records label. It's a fabulous record. So, it's really good. Which, yeah. which needs to be reissued. We should talk about that. <laughs> Maybe I, try to track Russell down at some point. Yeah, and Russell's another person who seems to have fallen off the, the face of the earth. I mean, Jim and Jack are both uh, are both uh, passed away, but nobody knows what happened to Russell. Yeah. Really? Mm. All I know is that he was like working for the post office. <laughs> All right. I know. I, that wasn't on my bingo card for him, but okay. <laughs> so, Jeff, do you remember John Gold in the studio, uh, Radio Tokyo, with you guys putting this together? Yeah, but I mean, you know, he he had uh, Bruce and Bruce and Phil had the most interaction with him. I I 
I was a, a bit aloof. I was probably in, you know, some bad place around that time. So I was not, I was not, I, I was not going to be able to do any kind of business kind of interactions with people at that point in my life. So, um, yeah. yeah, so I remember him, all, you know, all positive. Um, but again, you know, I was, I was reacting most to this, you know, being in that studio was just confining and, and, you know, the wall was like absorbing all our sound and blah, 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 you know. Yeah, it was a small place, small, yeah, yeah studio. But, um, yeah, I think that was when you were also, that was during the time you were in Wasted Youth as well. So, um, it, uh, you know, I'm sure there was a lot going on. And it was, I mean, that was definitely a challenging time for, when we were at Radio Tokyo with Mark as well, Mark was going through some pretty serious um, mental health issues at the time. And I, I remember the day that we laid down the, the basic tracks for Ivory Coast. Um, we were late because he was, I don't know, something was going on he was freaking out he couldn't drive so i had to go pick him up with his drums and it took me like a half hour to get him in the car and i think that there had been some episode like a month before where his parents were trying to take him to a um kind of a men mental health clinic and he jumped out of the car on the freeway and so i was kind of like i'm not getting on the freeway and as soon as he got in the car is like his hand went to the door handle and I drove from like West Hollywood to Venice at like 30 miles an hour on side streets because I just did not want to deal with anything. Wow. And so, I mean, we barely got, I mean, you can, there's, if you listen carefully, you can hear there, there's a flub on the drumming on Ivory Coast that I realized we're not going to get anything better out of him that day. And I think he did like after that session, he was back in the hospital for about a month. So. Wow. We had to kind of finish the record without him. It was, it was, I mean, the guy was brilliant <clears throat> and I, I, I love him, you know, and, um, but he definitely had a lot of, of, uh, mental health issues. And I think drug use was, was part of the issue as well. So, um, a lot of the substance don't mix well with Hal Dolling. No, and I, you know, I always uh, wish him well, you know. So Jeff, you were part of the rhythm section with Mark. How did, how, how was that connection as a rhythm section? I mean, awesome. I mean, Mark drummed like his life depended on it. So <laughs> I, I think it did. <laughs> I mean, yeah. just, I mean, just in a zone, in a zone. So it was easy. I, I guess that's so I'd have to say since he was in that zone, it was just easy to come alongside is the way I would describe it. Um, so, uh, but yeah, but I mean, he had his issues like Bruce is saying and, and um, he just felt for the guy because there was something internally going on there um, sometimes that just you couldn't help. Um, so, you know, the, those, those hiccups are just were, were part of what, what you endured. Yeah. He was, an, I have to say, he was an amazingly intense drummer. And I mean, uh, he, I don't know if you he, 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 he may also remember this. A lot of shows he would end up, his, his hands would just be bleeding, his knuckles, everything, because he'd be smacking them so hard. We, I remember on one of the tours that we did, he would, like every other show, or uh, he would kick through the head of the kick drum. Because he was playing so hard, he would just destroy it. You know, just... And, and, you know, he was completely self-taught. He wasn't somebody that, you know, had, had a lot of lessons or coaching on technique or whatever. And um, other drummers that I've worked with that he listened to him play, they're like, oh, my God, I, I don't know how he does those beats. I don't know how he, his sense of time yeah. is very interesting. It's kind of a push-pull flu fluidity to it. Yeah. Um, and it's like, like I've been told by his, like some you know, really, really amazing drummers. He, he's a, you know, that Mark is just like his own, his own category. He goes, oh, as long as I've been playing, I couldn't do what he does. I just, I, I just couldn't, you know. I would, say, 
as a, to Mr. Erskine. Yeah, I, as a listener, I feel like whatever was happening um, internally with him, he definitely channeled that into his performance, and you can hear that on Tragic Figures. Yeah. You know, I, it's funny. I asked him one time um, about where he was cutting his hands. Um, and as it came out, what he was doing was he had a way of drumming and he would sort of lash out at the cymbals. And he'd cut his hand on the edges of the cymbals and he Ouch. wouldn't realize it. He'd just keep going. Yeah, it's like he was in the zone. He didn't feel it. I, I watched sometimes and he'd be he'd be like sometimes just like his knuckles that hit the rim of like yeah. the rim of the snare or the rim of the tom yeah. and it's just you know after every show or before the show sometimes he'd have to tape up all of his fingers because he was uh they were so beat up wow. yeah. but, so i wanted to move on to the aesthetic of the album if we can it's got a very oops, let's look at the front first let's it's got a very um unusual cover and um the image here, uh, Bruce, was this your idea or who, who came up with the idea for the, the front cover? Yeah, you know, when we first started rehearsing in the tunnels at UCLA, there were a lot of Iranian students at the time. And, and so, and it was right around the time of the Iranian revolution. And so they were very concerned about what was happening over there. And, and so there were a lot of, they would get together to, to have rallies or to have, you know, have speakers talking about what's going on in their homeland. And so there were all of these posters and flyers up around campus. And I remember, I think it was the first rehearsal or one of our early rehearsals, we came out of the tunnels to listen to what we had just done on the boom box. We were sitting at the, um, it was North Campus and we were, were sitting by these vending machines and I look up above the vending machine and there's this flyer, this poster with that photograph on it and some Farsi, red Farsi script across the top of it. And people had been trying to like tear it down. It was like half there and half not there. And I looked up at that and I was kind of like, that's our album cover. Wow. <laughs> and, I don't know, you know, if you've got the Savage Impressions book, I I took a, a Polaroid of that so I could remember it. And it's a good thing I did because like two weeks later it was gone. Uh -huh. So, or other things have been posted up over it. So I, you know, that Polaroid I think is is in the, the book. Um, but yeah, that was sort of my idea is that I want, I, I, I wanted to create something that if you were in a record store and you were flipping through the bins, you would come to this record and you would just pull it out and go, what the hell is this and where did it come from? Mm. That was the response I, I wanted people to have. And, and I think we succeeded. And the so, yeah. yeah. Um, and of course, you know, we realized we needed the name of the band on there. And so there was a sticker on the cover that had on the shrink wrap, you know, that would have the name of the band. But um, I really like the idea of it being minimal. It's like, there's the front cover, the back cover is this collage that Phil did because he, you know, he was going around campus and tearing posters off of telephone poles and he made this amazing collage. And, and so I managed to, you know, figure out how to translate that into, into letterpress printing plates and carved linoleum blocks. and. So it's an interpretation of this beautiful collage that he made. Yeah, so. that's some that's some amazing stuff. Because there were um, there were you know like West LA, Westwood, Beverly Hills area. There's a, a huge you know Iranian community, and at the time of the revolution, there were different factions of people. Some some who supported the revolution, some that were opposed to it, some that were pro-Shah people, anti-Shah people. There'd be all these demonstrations at the federal building. Everybody was putting their posters up on top of other people's posters, tearing it down, layering. So yeah, you know, with what Phil, Phil did for that back cover, you would see that on the sides of buildings or on uh, the, the power box on the street or, or on a wall oh, someplace. Yeah. That whole feeling of like these different layers of uh, political speech kind of poking through that you couldn't understand because it's in Farsi. 
So Phil, when you were putting that together, were you putting that together with the intention that it would be the back cover? Uh, not really. Um, I, I wanted to make a collage. Um, I didn't know uh, when I started making it, I didn't know if it was going to be on the uh, album or not. I, I hoped it would have been. Uh. Um, but certainly, I have to tell you, um, I got a lot of nasty stares. <laughs> I was staring stuff up and down from bulls until they figured out I had no absolute idea what I was doing and had no <laughs> idea what they were talking about. You know, again, the Farsi and everything. So they kind of left me alone. Um, but, you know, the funny part is, is I, uh, when I finally put it all together, um, you know, I thought it was, it didn't really matter what they were saying. And so I kind of thought it had a feel to it. You know, you didn't really have to know what the lettering was or, and it seemed to go, I thought it went really well with the front cover. Yeah. Which I remember Bruce bringing in that day. And I, I remember saying right away, oh, that's the front cover. That's a beauty. That's a beauty. <laughs> And the graphics also really tied into the music itself. I mean, it, you know, it's not like you, you, you buy this because you think it's this some artifact from some uh, strange place that you have no idea where it's from and you put it on and it's, you know, whatever, easy listening, uh, you know, pop. <laughs> right. it, 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 the the, uh, the visual uh, sensibility of it and, and the, the kind of, whether it's intentional or not, the political subtext kind of matched, you know, just meshed 100% with the, with the music, you know, the music and the visual. So I think that's another reason why it's, it adds to its uh, sustaining power. <laughs> no, it really does. It really does. I still have the original collage. Oh, wow. Wow. Excellent. I had to put Hoping it. Hoping you would say that. I had to <laughs> Well, I to me throw something out that's hard to believe. <laughs> you may have realized by now, but you know, I, everyone said if, if I had had my way, I'd, I'd be a hoarder for sure. And I was like, oh yeah, one of my goals in life. But, um, you know, I had to put it under glass though because it started to uh, deteriorate. But oh. I still do have the original if anyone ever wants to see it. So, I would love to see it again. Yeah. 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 I do so, have it, so, Bruce, I had a question. Um, as we're slowly going through the whole IPR catalog, I would imagine that Tragic Figures is probably one of the top sellers from the from the discography. Um, there's multiple editions that you ended up running, yeah. um, at least five yourself, um, and then it went on to other different pressings. So I imagine this is one of the your top sellers. Yeah, I would I would say that um, it it would be the second the second uh, top seller. Yeah, behind the Kiefer Van Beethoven album. Yeah, I figured it would definitely be at the top. And um, some of the people that you guys influenced were incredible. I remember reading an interview with Peter Buck of REM, stating that, and people were, um, and Phil knows I was a huge REM fan, and they were stating how great Murmur was at the time, and he said. Murmur is not great. Tragic Figures is great. Wow. Nice. But yeah, so uh, the album went on to, I mean, it's influenced all kinds of people, but um, just the reach of the album is incredible of, of people that you wouldn't expect um, being well, yeah. what it is. And that's one of the things that I wanted to, that I was trying to do with the, the, in, the special insert in the deluxe edition of, of the reissue is I did reach out to a lot of people, musicians and other people in the music industry um, to get their uh, thoughts about tragic figures. And, you know, there were a number of other people that I was hoping to hear from, some who said they, you know, would try to do something, but were ultimately were not able to pull something together. But I knew at the time that we, we definitely had some some major fans, you know, I know Jello Biafra from Dead Kennedys was a huge fan of the band and um, um, the actually, I mean, the Butthole Surfers uh, yeah, yeah. met them early on when we, when the band was first coming together and, and Gibby and Paul had come out to spend the summer at Venice Beach and my girlfriend at the time uh, had met them and, and we, you know, we just kind of connected over music and, and 
uh, there was a show that we did at the Grandia Room in West Hollywood. When was that? I guess it was after the album came out, so it would have been 92 at some point. And they, it was like the Butthole Surfers first trip to LA. And so they opened for us. And then like, you know, three or four years later, Savage Republic got to open for them at the Roxy, you know, <laughs> in Hollywood. So I still have was, a tie that Gibby gave me at that show. Yeah. <laughs> so I mean, yeah, there were definitely some some kind of cool connections that we made early on. So. Yeah. Interesting. Um, a, a band that are huge fans actually of Savage Republic, Morosis. Oh yeah. They, uh, yeah. yeah they cool. uh, they have they they. The, they prime themselves by listening to our stuff before their shows. <laughs> Seriously, yeah. So, who knew? I wanted to end, um, if it's okay. We're so we're talking about the reissue, and we've mentioned it several times. So, Real Gone Music came out, and they released this expanded edition that we've been talking about with all these fantastic bonus tracks on there. It's, they're amazing. What you guys have pulled together for this, or Bruce pulled together. Um, how did Real Gone get involved with the reissue? So it was interesting because, I mean, I this is a, something I've been thinking that I wanted to do for probably 10 years now. And there were, and there were a number of years there where I, I just, I didn't, I didn't have the wherewithal to do it all myself. And so I was looking for other labels that I might be able to license it to. And I was approached several times by other indie labels who wanted to reissue it but it was really important for me to do this to do a letterpress edition an expanded edition and do a version that where I could pull the original printing plates out of the closet and use them again and ultimately most of these other labels didn't want to do it or they or there was something or another that didn't feel right um, and then ultimately um, it was a friend of mine named Pat Thomas, who is a musician. Uh, he's a drummer, his band Mushroom, and he's also run a record label back in the 80s and works with a lot of reissue things. Um, he ended up getting in touch and saying, you know, Gordon Anderson at, at Real Gone Music is a huge fan of this record. And I think that would be a really good place for this to go. And so Gordon and I started talking and it was, it was a long drawn out process and, and we had finally reached an agreement to, uh, to do this reissue with Real Gone. And right shortly after that, um, my friend Jeff Clark approached me about restarting IPR. Okay. So I mean, if this hadn't been in, 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 the, in the works with, with Real Gone, it would have gone for IPR, but we ended up, I, you know, the licensing ended up going through Real Gone, okay. and then Gordon and I worked out an agreement to do this special letterpress edition of 300 copies that we then split the edition. It's only available through mail order or websites. So, so yeah. if anybody wants that version, that you go to your Bandcamp page or the Independent Project, yeah, page to find that. And, and there's, there's still copies yeah. available at this point. Yes, there are. We've been we've been shipping them out for the last two weeks, though, so they're going fast. Yeah. So now is the time. Yes. So this record to me is a total classic, and I know several people have said the same thing. I've talked to many, many, many people who always list this as a classic. Um, and in closing, I wanted to get your three thoughts. Decades later, looking back, in a nutshell, what? How do you feel about Tragic Figures at this point? Um, and being part of it. Jeff, we'll start with you, if that's okay. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to be a part of it because of uh, Bruce and Phil, uh, just, you know, great, great guys to make music with, um, you know, and so I, I have, I have fun, fun memories. Nice, nice. So it sounds like you're proud of it. It's not something that you look back and regret that. 
Uh, you know, when I look back, I mean, I'll just be completely honest with you. When I look back, you know, I think about where I was at that time and a lot of it was not a good place. So, you know, that has nothing to do with tragic figures, but right. if you're asking me to reminisce, then that's what happens. Yeah. No, so yeah. I, I had a lot of stuff I had to work out and it took years and years to do. So, you know, uh, I'm, I'm in a much better place now. And, and so I, I, I can kind of go back in my mind and pick out really the, the the nice things and i really loved jamming with these guys at the brave dog for example and stuff like that so you know i yeah i'm yeah i'm i'm, I'm happy with the with the project very good uh greg and i have been talking about this quite a bit we we look at this record with a lot of fondness and a lot of it has to do with your contribution jeff so we appreciate oh well you appreciate, appreciate, that. appreciate thanks a lot here all right, Phil, what about you? Your thoughts decades later on Tragic Figures? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm a, well, I mean, I remember thinking, uh, keeping in mind, I don't remember a whole lot from then, but I remember thinking to myself that I was getting close to uh, graduating from art school. And um, I realized I had really no future in art. Um, mostly because I wasn't very interested in it. Sounds weird, but that's kind of how it was. And I figured I better pick something that's at least a little more, I might be able to make a living. So I figured to myself, better to be a starving musician than being a starving artist. <laughs> and so, you know, my other only choice I could think of was becoming a, a house painter, which is one of the things that I was doing back then to earn some extra money. Wow. So, you know, I kind of look back now and then, you know, I just think that as a as a jumping off place, when I look now, I always think to myself, I wonder what, what would happen, what I would have done. Because, uh, you know, at the same time, I was on the very verge of changing my major to political science. And that could have been very realistic as well um, for me. So, I've always thought of savage. Uh, I've always thought of um, tragic figures as kind of a, and I look back at it now today as kind of a validation that one of the stupidest things I ever did actually worked out. So I'm <laughs> pretty happy nice. about it, even to this day. I think, and I look at it now and I try to think to myself, what if I didn't know anything about this record? What would I? Who would I think these people are? And what the hell are they doing? <laughs> <laughs> Good point. I appreciate, it's funky, man. <laughs> I, can tell you. I appreciate you saying that because I know knowing you as I do, you're not one to look back. You're always one to look forward. So I appreciate you taking time to join us to talk about uh, the past here with this. Bruce, what about your last thoughts uh, or looking back on Tragic Figures decades later? I, you know, I remember at the time, I mean, I was very proud of it, but I also at the time I just I would I had a hard time listening to it because I I would hear all the things that weren't the way I imagined they would be in my head and so but I also knew that we had done something really special and really unique and I I knew as, as I think I, I I mentioned in the interview that um, got written about in in Richie Unterberger's um, liner notes is that whole story about when Phil and I first heard Next to Nothing on the radio for the first time. Yeah. And I just remember thinking it was so different from everything else that was, on, that was being played. I mean, that was Rodney on the Rock. He was playing all the cool punk rock and indie records, but our stuff stood out. It was like from some other planet. And I thought, wow, we really did something unique here. And thinking back, I was like, there's no record that's like this ever. There hasn't been prior to this. And here we are 40 years later, and there's, there's no record that's like this that's come out since. And I, so to me, I'm really proud that the three of us and Mark Erskine created this <clears throat> unique document um, it was a special time and we had a special creativity that we all 
put together and this is what came out. And, um, and so, yeah, I'm very proud of it. Oh, it's amazing. It's amazing. I'm so glad that Real Gone got involved or somebody got involved to, to help out with the licensing and that, that this yeah. is out now in the reissue form. And as I mentioned before, the, the bonus tracks are fantastic. It's, it's a great document. Um, and if there's more, and there could be a, another archival piece, <laughs> sign me up for the pre-order right now. <laughs> okay. All right, you guys, I, we really appreciate you guys coming on. It took, it took something to get us all together at the same time, but uh, thank you to the three of you for coming on. Um, and I know y'all had sure. a big, big impact on Greg's uh, many years that followed this album. So I know. Absolutely. So thank you all for coming. Jeff, it was finally good to, to meet you digitally and, and get to talk to you. Yeah, same so. there. <laughs> All right, you guys. Thank you yeah, so thanks, much. Thanks, Jeff and, and Greg. Really appreciate it. All right, you guys. Yeah. Have a good night. Very informative. Yeah. Have a good one.